I love y'all. <laughs> this is a moment that, um, that I thank God for. The way is in my heart. And I love y'all. <laughs> and so thank you for your continued love and prayers and understanding and support. Because walking away from here was not an easy thing to do. In this moment, I think, thank you, tells me just how hard it still is. Because this church renewed a hope in me that was dying. The people of this church renewed something in me. It resurged something in me that was about to die. And so when the scripture says, strengthen what remains and is about to die, I feel like God gifted my family with that hope and with that gift. So thank you for receiving me, for receiving Dedry, for receiving our children. Thank you um, for the love. It can be hard out there for a sister. <laughs> Um, so I am thankful and I'm always grateful for, for God who is, um, patient with me and kind to me and loving to me, even when I'm not kind and patient and loving towards God. And so, um, I always want to give shout outs to God. I want to always give shout outs to my husband, Dedrick, who, um, is a model husband in my opinion. And I am thankful um, for the way he loves God, for the way he loves me, for the way he loves our children. As always, my brother Mike, I love you, man. Sharice, I love you, sister. Um, and so I, I am thankful for the work they continue to do and the press they continue to give. Well, I won't belabor the fact. Because as most of you may know, for those of you who don't know me, I don't plan to be up here all that long. Hey, Amen. Maybe, maybe like five minutes longer since I haven't seen y'all in a year. Amen. Amen. But someone just keep tabs for me. But um, I was tasked with preaching this morning around celebration. And um, it was a dilemma for me because we're in the midst of grief, right? We're in the midst of pain. And so how do we celebrate in the midst of this? And, and so, you know, really praying and doing a lot of work and, you know, um, had some people came got really late last night after we got back and you know I was sitting at the table you know rereading through my stuff and editing and everything and I was sitting at the table and you know I was like all the church people I said you know I, I don't have a title for this sermon you know and so I kind of gave them a premise of what the sermon was about like you know some of the core pieces I said I need y'all to help me come up with a title I mean I heard a whole lot of stuff what was some of the stuff we heard we heard you know uh, celebrate anyhow right and you know there's a light at the end of the tunnel right but you know out of the mouth of the prophet Moses <laughs> came this a just celebration and I think it is appropriate um, for what God has really laid um, on my heart this morning, a just celebration. So our scripture this morning comes from the gospel according to Luke 15, verses 31 through 32. This is the new revised standard of the version. So if you're reading a different version, it may read a bit differently from yours, but it reads as follows. Then Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of my property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country, and there he squandered his property in dissolute living. Then when he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired hands have bread enough to spare? 
But here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. And get the fatted calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is now alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked what was going on, and he replied, your brother has come, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has gotten him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him. But he answered his father, listen, for all these years, I have been working like a slave for you, and I have never disobeyed your command, yet you have never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you kill the fatted calf for him? Then the father said to him, son, you are always with me and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of the Lord stands forever. Amen. Let's bow for a word of prayer. God, you have been ever so present with us, not just this morning, but throughout the duration of our lives. And yet, God, all of time kind of culminates in this moment because this is all that we really have. We don't have what happened yesterday. We don't have what will happen tomorrow. But God, we have this moment. And so we pray that the power and the presence of your spirit will help us be fully present right here, right now. Make our ears keen to the sound of your voice, that we may hear, that we may receive, and that we might be transformed by hearing your word. Give us what we need, God. We are open, we are ready, and we are willing to say yes. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So a parable is a story that teaches a lesson or a principle and Jesus was often teaching in parables. His audience specifically for this parable um, was a mixed audience. So there were people in the audience that he was talking to who were his disciples, people who followed him. There were also people in the audience there who were not people who went to church or synagogue or who was connected to faith. And then there were also people who were very established in their faith. The Jewish leaders or the rulers within a certain sect within the Jewish faith called Pharisees. And so in this section of Luke, Jesus actually gives three parables, all of which have the same intent. And that is no matter who you are, if you're just one person seemingly insignificant, God cares about you. There is one point only. God will go to great lengths to find one and then celebrate because God found you. So Jesus is teaching this and he is giving these parables and our parable today is quite possibly or arguably the most um, famous or well-known parable in the Bible, both in Christian circles and outside. We hear the parable of the prodigal son everywhere. A man has two sons. I imagine the elder son is far more responsible than the younger. 
He's the one that's working, right? He's the one that always goes the extra mile. He's the one that's always dependable. He's the one that, yes, he likes to hang out with his friends, but never before he finishes his work. Because how can you really enjoy your downtime if you still got work? to do. The younger son is the exact opposite. He is the life of the party. He is always trying to find some way to get out of working. He is always trying to be distracted by something else. And by the time we get to the place of our parable, the younger son has decided, uh-uh, I am done with this family working thing. I have done my part. He goes to his father in his privilege. And we know he goes in his privilege because he does not ask his father for his inheritance. He informs his father, I want my inheritance. His father concedes. He gives his younger son his portion, and he goes out into the world to do whatever and whomever he so chooses. He depletes all of his funds, and by the time he is depleted, there is a severe famine in the country. There is a recession, maybe even a great depression. He is homeless. He is hungry. He is dirty. He is destitute. He finally finds work. Talk about underemployed. Working on a farm, feeding swine, feeding pigs, and his lowest moment comes when he realizes that he wants the food that he's feeding to the pigs. In that moment, some um, versions of this parable says he came to himself. Now that'll preach. That ain't what we preaching today, but that'll preach. I'll just, you know, hey, Pastor Mike might come back and preach that, what it means to come to yourself. He realizes, hey, there are servants in my father's house who eat well, who have no need for anything. I have somewhere that I belong. I have people who love me. I have a place that is called home. I have forgotten that I belong somewhere. Yeah. He comes to himself, and he begins to rehearse his repentance in his mind. He says, okay, I am going to humble myself. I'm going to tell my daddy that I have sinned against him, that I have hurt him, that I am not worthy of him. And he is making his way back across the country, down the long roads, hitching rides and trying to beg people for money for a bus fare. And he finally gets to the long drive leading to his daddy's house. He's running it through his head again, his humility, right? His repentance. When he looks up and he sees his father's house just around the bend, but somebody is running frantically towards him. A friend of mine recently preached this passage and she said that in this culture, during this time, a man of this boy's father's stature, it was considered both disgraceful and uncommon for a man of his stature to be running. It was disgraceful for a grown man who owned property to be running, and yet here he is running without any resolve for the things and the people around him towards love and reconciliation for his son. He gets to him. He clings to him. He kisses him. And his son is saying, Daddy, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I have hurt you. I have sinned against you. I'm not worthy of you. His father does not even respond. He turns and looks to the closest servant. He says, I want you to go and get my best robe. I want you to put it on my son. I want you to put the ring of my house back on his finger. I want you to put shoes on his dirty, bare feet. He says, and then I want you to kill the biggest calf I got. Everybody in the house is going to eat some steak tonight. <laughs> if the sun won't happy, the, the service was happy. <laughs> We're going to celebrate for my son was what he was dead. And now he is alive. He was lost. Yeah. But now he is found. And they began to party hard. They eating steak. They're eating the nicest stuff they can eat. They got their dancing shoes on, and it is loud, and the elder son is making his way up the hill. He is sweaty. He is covered in dirt. 
He has been working the fields all day. He is tired. And all of a sudden, he hears all this commotion. All he wants is a silent space and some water. He calls a servant. He says, what in the world is going on? What is all this noise? He says, man, your, son, your brother has come home, and your daddy has killed this great big old calf, and we are all eating, and we are all celebrating. And in that moment, I can imagine that it was as if his father had spit in his face. He says, what? He's celebrating. He's celebrating the dude who went off and spent all his money, who never really helped us all this time, and he's celebrating that? He's angry, and he refuses to go in. When his father hears, he has already had compassion for one son, and now he has compassion for another. He comes out to where his son is, and he says, son, come on, come in. He says, daddy, I've been here this whole time. He says, I've been working hard for you. He says, I've been doing everything you asked me to do. I was always obedient. He says, I have laid down my life for you. He says, but he takes his money that's not even his because he ain't done no work. He go out, do Lord knows whatever with it, and then he come back and you throw this big celebration. But you couldn't even give up one goat, just one small goat. For me to celebrate with my friends? No, Daddy, I ain't going up in there. Y'all tripping. <laughs> His father says to him, he says, Son, you are with me always. And everything, he says, no, look, listen, hear me. Everything I have is yours. It belongs to you. He was like, but your brother was dead. And today, I looked up and I saw him running down the driveway and I knew that my dead son had come back to life. He says, now we have got to celebrate that. It is right to celebrate that. Come on in. Now the story, Jesus leaves us hanging. We don't know. <laughs> I hope he went in. <laughs> After all that, I really hope this brother went into the house but we don't know what happens now I have read this parable so many times over the years I have probably heard more sermons on it than any other passage of scripture and every time every time many times the pastors or the preachers or the evangelists or whomever was preaching have preached this passage from a place where this elder son is wrong, right? He's wrong in his anger. He's wrong in this place. But you know, I'm reading this passage and I'm like, you know, I can feel this brother. I know why he's angry. I can feel his injustice, right? Like, I've been doing everything I'm supposed to do and all of a sudden you celebrating somebody who ain't done jack? No, that ain't how it work, right? I feel his anger. And so I went back to the parable and I read and I reread and I said, you know what? In Jesus' telling of this parable, I don't see him rebuking the older son's anger. We can't afford to not enter into the discipline of celebration. Bow your heads, close your eyes. Just acknowledge for a moment that God is right here, right now. that God is meeting you right where you are. God is meeting you right in the midst of your confusion, in the midst of your pain, in the midst of your anger, in the midst of your joy, in the midst of your anticipations. No matter what's going on inside of you, God wants to be a part of that. God is not afraid of our questions, of our doubt. But God is compassionate. So just spend a moment lifting to God who loves you. What it is you need to lift to God. Maybe you can't articulate it in language. Maybe you just see the images. Maybe you see a relationship that needs to be repaired. Maybe you see finances that need to be in place. Maybe you see a community that needs to be healed. Maybe you see your child who is um, lost to you. Maybe you see any number of faces, things, people, or situations. Just envision it. That is prayer in this moment.
And maybe there's someone here who has come into this space, but they're like, I don't know if I even have enough faith for all of this. I don't know if I believe or can trust God to make this thing right. To you, I say it's okay you're in the right place because somebody besides you may have enough for you. When you are in doubt, you enter into community. When you are in doubt, you enter around people who can intercede for you. And so just imagine for a moment that in this space now, as the Spirit of God is moving from, from corner to corner, up and down, as the Spirit of God is just moving in this place, I want you to imagine that there is a collective body of faith in this space. There's a collective body of belief. There's a collective parts of our spirits that says, maybe not by myself, but together we can believe that the impossible is possible. You, Lift up your petitions to God in this space. Pray for your mother, for your father, for your sister, your brother, your husband or your wife, your children, your aunties, your uncles, your friends, your community. Pray for yourself. God, we are thankful that you have ensured our inheritance, that we have a sense of security, God, that nothing we do or nothing we don't do can make you love us any more or any less than you already do. Your love is the highest universal truth there ever will be. God, we thank you and we praise you now in Jesus' name that you said we could come before you and we could pray and we can ask and it will be given. God, we thank you that you said all we needed was faith the size of a mustard seed. Yes. And that with that mustard seed, God, we could move mountains. Well, God, we got mountains that need to be moved in this place today. God, we stand in the valleys and we look up and sometimes we forget, almighty God, that our journey is not up the hill, but it's to move the hill. God, we depend upon your power and your spirit to give us what we can't give to ourselves. Freedom, liberation, salvation, redemption, deliverance, healing. God, we pray, God, that you give us what we need where we are. Where there is doubt, God, enter in, be with us in it, and dispel it. Where there is pain, God, be with us in it, enter in, and dispel it. Where there is hopelessness, God, lift us up by entering in, be with us in it, and dispel it. God, where we have fear that what you have given us to do cannot come to pass, God, relinquish in us our no's that we might say yes. God, this is your body. We are your people. And God, you have privileged us to be a part of the redemption of this world. And so God, allow us to love right where we are in the spaces where you've placed us. Help us to have minds and hearts of peace and justice. So God, whatever healing needs to happen in us, God, allow that healing to happen, not just for our sake, but God, for the sake of others that we will encounter. God, this world needs to hear what we have discovered, God. This is the best kept secret that we need to be yelling from the tops of the buildings. And so God, loose our tongues that we might speak. Loose our tongues that we might praise. Loose our tongues that we might worship, lose our tongues that we might celebrate. And in celebrating God, may we give others permission to receive your love and healing. So God, meet us where we are. Take the things that we've given to you and in your providence, in your power, do with them what you want to do with them. God, we don't make any claims on how you do what you do because you are God. So relinquish in us any desire to try to tell you what to do. Relinquish in us any desire to resist your command and your instruction. Resist in us any feeling or any thought that we must defend ourselves because, God, you are our defense. Heal us. Give us what we need. 
In the name of he who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.